Welcome back to The Factory. A couple of episodes ago, we were looking at the design for a 10-bit R2R DAC. This was just a theoretical idea at the time, but those prototypes have arrived. They've been assembled. And we're not just gonna show you a, a, like a hello world with this. Brenton's actually shot right through and is able to play music through this DAC. Just a reminder, a DAC or digital analog converter is something that takes the digital signals like that from the pins of a microcontroller and converts it into an analog voltage suitable for, say, playing audio or creating other waveforms. Before we check out the DAC, the GitHub user Liam Howell has been working on PikaDev in his own spare time and has made an enhancement to the SSD 1306, the OLED module, so that the OLED can now display circles. I've actually already used this code in some future tutorials, so if you're watching, Liam, thanks very much. So that's just another example of open source doing what open source does best. All right, let's check out the DAC. So yes, we're gonna talk about the DAC again this week. Last time we looked at the DAC, it was just in KiCad. We had a circuit diagram, we had some theoretical behavior. This time, we've actually got a pair of modules that we're gonna play with. Of the two modules that we've currently built, the two prototypes, we've got one that's been built with 100K resistors and another that's been built with 1K resistors. So the difference between these two is gonna be made apparent by the fact that the Raspberry Pi Pico's output pins are not ideal sources. They've got some source impedance, and we're thinking that on the 1K version, that's gonna introduce some errors. So let's have a look. So the first demonstration we're gonna look at with this DAC is just putting every single number we can into the DAC and looking at the voltages that come out. That means we have a sawtooth waveform. To generate that, we're just creating this loop that counts from every number from zero to 1023 and puts that number onto our DAC. If you look at the oscilloscope, you'll actually see a very small discontinuity about halfway up the oscilloscope. And that is the result of the 1K resistors on the first prototype DAC introducing some error. So because the 1K allowed the parasitic resistances in this circuit to be a little bit too significant, we did another prototype with 100K resistors and it works a lot better. On the sawtooth waveform, you can see that this is significantly smoother. There's no discontinuity in the middle. And so this actually produces a far more precise and in the end, better sounding piece of hardware. Getting into a waveform that's a little bit more interesting, we're gonna play a sine wave through this DAC. Now this sine wave is actually being streamed off the SD card um, and then the DAC is playing it and it's going to the oscilloscope for a little bit of analysis. On the oscilloscope, you can see the sine wave there and you can see also the Fourier transform of the signal as in the frequency spectrum of the output signal. And you can see a huge peak on the left-hand side where the sine wave is being shown. And then to the right of that, there's a bunch of smaller peaks. All these smaller peaks are basically all the errors in the system um, coming out as these extra, uh, extra frequencies. Now these errors are something around 54 decibels below that main peak, which is close to what you'd expect from a 10-bit DAC like this. Uh, there's some errors because it's only a 10-bit DAC. The theoretical um, performance here is about 60 dB. And there's a few other errors there due to the way the numbers are being handled in software. I'm truncating 16-bit numbers down to 10-bit instead of rounding and so forth. But basically the performance is about where we expect it to be. Now for the demo we've all been waiting for, we're gonna actually play a song from the SD card through the DAC, through the speaker. And we're also gonna be recording it with the PC directly out of the DAC for comparison. So how on earth does this system actually work on a Raspberry Pi Pico all written in MicroPython? Well, there's a few little secrets that come into this. The really crucial one was using DMA, that is direct memory access. That's a type of peripheral that's on the Raspberry Pi Pico that can read from an array in memory and write it somewhere else in memory. So in this project, the DMA controller is actually reading from an array of audio data and dumping it into the PIO and then the PIO is pushing it out to the DAC at the sample rate of our audio file. There's another big trick here though, and that is actually using two buffers. Let's go to a diagram. So we've got our wave data somewhere on an SD card. It's being read by the CPU, and the CPU is doing some processing on that data. Specifically, it's taking signed data that's in the wave file and turning it into unsigned data for our DAC. And that data is being put into a buffer. So the buffer here is just an array. It's a long list of numbers um, that just represent the wave file to be played. At the same time as this buffer 
here, this buffer number one is being filled in with data from the WAV file um, by the CPU. A second buffer is actually being emptied in a sense. It's being read by a thing called the DMA controller and it's taking data from this buffer, putting it into the PIO driver uh, on the Raspberry Pi Pico and it's then dumping that data onto our DAC. So we've got these two things happening at the same time. This buffer is being filled in with data from the WAV file by the CPU. This buffer is being played to our speaker by the direct memory access controller. And so what ends up happening is this buffer two hopefully gets emptied well after this buffer one has been filled up. And so when buffer two gets emptied, it can swap with buffer one so that this one starts to get filled up with new data and this one that was fill, filled gets pushed to the DAC. If, if buffer two ends up emptying faster, you know, this buffer gets empty before buffer one has actually been filled up, you get a condition called a buffer underrun, and basically you just get a gap in the music. You know, it, 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 it gets all chopped up. So this is a pretty complicated system, but we didn't jump right into this. I actually started by just filling up a single array in the Raspberry Pi Pico's memory, and then playing that to the DAC one sample at a time. The limitation here is how much RAM you've got on the RP2040 chip. So really it's about one second. You, you don't get much more than about one second of WAV file data at a very slow sample rate. So it makes it work, but it's very limiting. The step above that was then streaming data from the Raspberry Pi Pico's flash memory. Um, that gives you somewhere between five and 10 seconds of WAV file data, and that's limited by the size of the flash memory that comes with the Pico. Um, but again, still fairly limiting. Uh, and then the bridging step was streaming off the Raspberry Pi Pico's memory through the DMA controller. And once that was working, there was you know, not too much in the way to actually make it work from an SD card. So one of the design features of MicroPython that made this pretty straightforward to go from the Raspberry Pi Pico's memory to an SD card is the fact that you can mount an SD card as if it is the internal memory. So in Thony here, you can see this folder called SD. This is actually the files on the SD card that's mounted on this breadboard. Um, and that's just mounted with the UOS uh, module there. And the great thing about this is that you can have the same Python code play files off the internal memory or play files off the SD card because they don't both just opened with an open function. So in this development process, there was actually one interesting little hiccup we had. While combining reading from the SD card with using the DMA controller, it was actually crashing and it took me a long time to work out why. It turns out that when you use the hardware SPI peripheral through MicroPython on the Raspberry Pi Pico, it actually uses a DMA controller to do that read and write, write transfer. Um, the trouble though is that this isn't documented in the documentation, or at least I didn't see it there. Um, so I actually found it in the source code for MicroPython. Uh, in the machine underscore SPI.c file, you'll see this blob of code at the start of the um, SPI transfer function that basically says, if the length of our transfer is bigger than 32, it gets a couple of DMA channels to, uh, to help with that transfer. Um, and because by default, this seems to use DMA controllers zero and one, it wasn't until I started using a different DMA controller, of which there are thankfully 12, uh, that this whole system started working. There you go. So we started on open source doing what open source does best, and we're finished on it as well. You know, if we couldn't dig into the MicroPython source code to find out just that, just that little quirk with how DMA controllers are assigned by MicroPython, we would never have been able to get to this point where we can stream arbitrarily long audio files off an SD card. Now, if, this were, if this were some binary blob that were locked down and proprietary, that would never have happened. In any case, that's all we have for you this week. If you have any questions about this content or if you just want to see something a little closer, let us know on the Core Electronics forums. Until next time, thanks for watching.